Okay, um, hello everybody. Okay, great. Um, so, uh, can we uh, get going? Um, so, so, I'd like to welcome everybody to the, uh, this year's uh, Lion Robbins Memorial Lectures. Uh, I think we calculated it's the 28th one. Uh, so, this, has been, this series has been running for some time. Um, so, I'm truly delighted to, uh, to welcome um, Raj Chetty here um, for, the, uh, for, for this year's um, series of lectures. So, there will be three lectures uh, tonight, uh, tomorrow evening, and Wednesday evening. Uh, on uh, issues to do with um, uh, intergenerational mobility uh, and uh, both in terms of the geography of intergenerational mobility, policies that we might think about uh, trying, to, uh, trying to look at the legitimacy of in terms of perhaps raising uh, mobility uh, and uh, issues to do with uh, the more macro picture about uh, the extent of mobility and innovation and um, economic growth. Um, so, as I say, I'm very pleased to, to, to welcome Raj to come and give, the, uh, give these talks. Uh, he's currently a professor uh, in, uh, at, in the economics department at Stanford University, uh, and he's also the co-director of a public economics program um, at the National Bureau of Economic Research. Um, so he's got a very strong track record for anybody who might have looked him up uh, on the internet in terms of publishing highly influential uh, policy-relevant uh, empirical research, typically using uh, big data, uh, often administrative data, sometimes matched up to other sources, to look at uh, key issues um, of relevance to economic policy. So some of the areas, uh, not all of them, but some of the areas that Raj has worked on include tax policy, um, unemployment, uh, the economics of education, in particular uh, work about teacher effectiveness, and on social mobility. Um, so the lectures today are going to, the lectures we're going to hear uh, are going to be about, about that area. Uh, so just a little bit more about, about Raj's background. So he uh, received his PhD from Harvard at the age of 23 um, in 2003, uh, which is pretty impressive, and then became a, a professor at Berkeley, University of California at Berkeley, returning to Harvard in 2009 as one of the youngest tenured professors, professors in all subjects in Harvard's history, uh, and then moved to Stanford uh, in 2015, uh, I think is right, um, on that. Uh, so uh, Raj has also been one of the uh, recipients of the John Bates Clark Medal, uh, given by the American Economic Association to the best economist um, aged under 40. Uh, and uh, I hope everybody will be delighted to hear um, what he's going to talk about. Uh, three lectures on improving equality of opportunity, new lessons from big data. And the first of those is t today's, um, today's offering uh, on the geography of intergenerational mobility. So I hope everybody would welcome Raj to come and speak. So thanks so much for the warm introduction, Steve. It's a pleasure to be back here at LSE. Can, can everyone hear me? Is the mic on? Um, it's, uh, it's a great pleasure to be able to give the Lionel Robbins lecture. So I'm going to talk about... Uh, intergenerational mobility and equality of opportunity, which is a topic that's attracting a lot of attention in the policy debate in the United States and many other countries around the world as we have growing inequality. And so I'm going to start uh, to motivate this topic at a very big picture level by talking about the American dream, which is a complicated concept that means different things to different people. But let's distill it to a simple statistic that we can measure systematically in the data which is the probability that a child born to parents in the bottom fifth of the income distribution makes the leap to the top fifth of the income distribution. So the classic rags to riches version of the American dream. How common is that in the United States versus other developed countries around the world where we have comparable data? So in the US, you can see here uh, about 7.5% of children born to parents in the bottom quintile make it all the way to the top quintile. That compares with 9% here in the UK, based on work that Steve has done, 11.7% uh, in Denmark, and 13.5% uh, in Canada. Now, when people look at these numbers, initially they sometimes react by saying, oh, even in Canada, it doesn't look like your odds of success are all that high, right? Only 13.5%. But we have to remember, of course, that no matter what we do, we can't have more than 20% of people in the top 20%, obviously. And so, uh, to, to put it more precisely, if you were to live in a society 
where your parents played no role at all in determining your outcomes, you'd expect to see at most, you know, you'd expect to see one fifth of children make that leap from the bottom 20% to the top 20%. So that I think is a plausible upper bound on what we think this conditional probability could be. In a society with perfect mobility, we'd have a 20% rate. And so relative to that upper bound, these are actually quite large differences in rates of upward mobility across countries. Uh, one way to think about it is that your chances of achieving the American dream are almost two times higher if you're growing up in Canada rather than the United States. Now, these differences across countries have attracted a lot of attention in the policy debate and have led to growing concern that the U.S. is no longer a land of opportunity contrary to, its, uh, traditional, to the traditional perception. But what I'm going to focus on today and what I think we can actually learn more from is the fact that upward mobility varies quite a bit across local areas within the United States. So I think this is useful in understanding what's going on because the cross-country comparisons are contaminated by a variety of factors, right? So there are all kinds of things that are different between Denmark, Canada, and the United States. So figuring out exactly what's driving the differences in rates of mobility uh, is quite challenging from purely cross-country comparisons. Whereas I think when we zoom into local area differences, we can potentially make more progress, which is uh, what I'll try to show in these lectures. So, um, in, what we're going to start with is calculating upward mobility for every metro and rural area in the United States and work uh, that we've done recently with Nathan Hendren, Pat Klein, and Emmanuel Saez, uh, where we use de-identified tax records on 10 million kids born between 1980 and 1982 in the U.S. So basically all children born in America between 1980 and 1982. We use that data to study the geography of intergenerational mobility uh, within America. So this work is an example, I think, of a broader trend in social science, uh, which is the increasing use of big data to answer various policy questions. Uh, data from administrative sources, data from Facebook, data from various different sources to tackle questions like inequality, poverty, and so on. And so what we're gonna do here with this data is classify children based on where they grew up and then track them no matter where they live as adults. So when I refer to locations throughout these lectures, I'm going to be referring to where you grow up as opposed to where you live as an adult, given that you know, uh, quite a few people move uh, across areas within the US. Okay, so using that data, we draw this map here, which shows you the geography of upward mobility in the United States. It, it plots the same statistic that I started out with your chances of reaching the top fifth of the income distribution, conditional on starting in a family in the bottom fifth. And uh, so what we do is divide the US into 740 different metro and rural areas, what are called commuting zones. And in each of those areas, we take the set of kids who grew up in that place, for example, in the Bay Area, San Jose here, Silicon Valley, uh, take the set of people who grew up there and ask what fraction make that leap from the bottom fifth to the top fifth. Now, the map is colored so that lighter colored areas represent areas with higher levels of upward mobility. And you can see, if you look at the scale, that there's a really broad spectrum of rates of upward mobility within the United States. So in the center of the country, for instance, you see rates of upward mobility exceeding 16%, higher than the numbers we saw for Denmark and for Canada. But if you look at places like Atlanta, Georgia, or Charlotte, North Carolina, you see numbers below 4.5% lower than uh, statistics we see in for any country for which we currently have data. So even within America, there's this incredibly broad spectrum in rates of upward mobility. Now, you can see the geographical patterns for yourself, but let me just point out a couple of them. So upward mobility is the highest, rates of social mobility are the highest, the center of the country, lowest in, in the southeast, relatively high on the coasts. Uh, while your eye initially gravitates to that broad regional variation, there's quite a bit of relatively local variation as well. So if you look, for instance, at Ohio versus Pennsylvania, two states with relatively similar economies and demographic structures, Ohio is near the bottom in terms of rates of upward mobility, whereas Pennsylvania looks extremely good. Another pattern that illustrates the granularity of the data, if you look in the center of the country here, it's South Dakota and North Dakota, both states with very high levels of upward mobility in general, except for this lower southwest corner of South Dakota, which has some of the darkest red colors on the map, the lowest rates of upward mobility in the US. 
What are those places? They're some of the largest Native American reservations uh, in the US where we know based on anecdotal evidence that there's chronic intergenerational poverty and you can see you're picking that up uh, in these tax records here. So in the big map, uh, you know, you see the broad variation across areas. But it turns out there's quite a bit of very local area variation as well. So here we're zooming in to the New York City metro area and looking at the data by county. And we're asking the same question, what fraction of the kids who grew up in each county in New York, which correspond to the boroughs, like Manhattan, the Bronx, Queens, et cetera, uh, what fraction of the kids in each of those places ends up making it to the top 20% of the national income distribution? When I talk about percentiles, they're always in the national distribution in everything that I'm showing you. Uh, and you can see that even you know, within New York, if you're in Manhattan, you know, in a low-income family, so presumably living in a place like Harlem, uh, you have a 9.9% .9 chance of making it from the bottom to the top, which looks pretty good relative to the US average, but is nowhere near as high if you just go uh, over a few miles to Queens where you see a number of 16.8%. So even within relatively small geographic areas, we see really substantial differences in ch children's chances of achieving the American dream, if you'd like. So motivated by those geographical patterns, in these lectures, I'm gonna uh, try to answer three questions. First, uh, today I'll talk about why rates of upward mobility vary so much across areas. Then tomorrow, I'll uh, talk about what policy changes can improve upward mobility in light of these findings. What can we learn from the geographic variation, both about local area policies and broader policies that might change levels of upward mobility. And then finally, in the third lecture, I'll uh, take a particular angle on normative issues and step back and ask, you know, do we want to improve rates of upward mobility? Is greater social mobility a good thing? And the distinction between relative mobility, moving up or down in the percentiles versus absolute mobility, having a higher uh, dollar income is going to be important there. And I'll talk about one angle from the perspective of innovation as a pathway to upward mobility, which suggests that at least some uh, methods of improving social mobility could potentially increase everyone's welfare and potentially raise economic growth. I think there can be a connection between inequality, opportunity, and economic growth. And so I'll focus on those issues in uh, the third lecture. All right, so let me give an outline of uh, what I'll talk about uh, today. Um, I'm gonna start by being a little bit more precise about how we measure intergenerational mobility systematically in the data. I gave you some examples with this bottom 20% to top 20% statistic, but that's not a comprehensive measure of intergenerational mobility, so I'll start with a more complete characterization. Then I will turn to examine this geographical variation from the lens of asking whether uh, this variation reflects the causal effects of where you grow up or whether it reflects sorting, meaning is the difference we see between Atlanta and uh, you know, San Francisco, for example, driven by the fact that the people who live in Atlanta are different from the people who live in San Francisco? Or is it that if you take a given child and put that child in San Francisco instead of Atlanta, we'll see different uh, outcomes for that child, meaning the place has a causal effect. That's a very important, long-standing question in social science, and it's gonna be critical to resolve that to go further and think about why mobility varies across areas and what policy implications follow. And then finally, I'll spend some time talking about the characteristics of low versus high mobility areas. What is it that's systematically different about these places that seem to offer very good opportunities for disadvantaged kids relative to places where kids are trapped in poverty? Everything that I'm talking about today is, draws primarily from these two papers. I'm not gonna summarize them in complete detail, so if you wanna read more on these topics, uh, you can look at uh, these two papers here. All right, so let's start with the first part uh, on measuring intergenerational mobility. So we began with a very simple measure, the probability of reaching the top fifth of the distribution starting from the bottom fifth. That measure has the advantage of being, I think, quite easy to interpret, but it of course uses only a small fraction of the data. So if you think about the transition matrix of quintiles of parents and quintiles of children, there are 25 numbers there. What fraction of kids start at the in the bottom quintile, make it to the fifth quintile, the fourth quintile, so forth and so on. Uh, and so we're really using you know, only 1 25th of the total data that we have when we look at that very simple bottom to top measure. 
So a more general measure that, that uses all the data is to measure the average percentile rank of the child conditional on the parent rank. So ask what percentile in the income distribution does a child reach on average if he starts in a family that's say at the 20th percentile or the 30th percentile, et cetera. Now this, as, as I will show you, this measure of rank-rank associations in intergenerational mobility, as opposed to other measures you can construct, like looking at the correlation of incomes in levels or things like that, this turns out to have very convenient statistical properties. And so that's why I'm gonna focus a lot on these percentile rank measures as opposed to dollar-based measures. So what we do is we rank children relative to others in the same birth cohort. So for example, take the four million kids who were born in 1980 in the United States, rank them from one to four million based on their incomes at roughly age 30, and convert that to percentile units. Analogously, we rank parents relative to other parents. So we're trying to hold age fixed, essentially, recognizing that incomes change uh, with age. And so we're ranking parents relative to other parents, and we're ranking kids relative to other kids. In everything that I show you, we're gonna use ranks in the national income distribution rather than the local distribution. So we're not ranking kids in San Francisco relative to each other, we're ranking everybody relative to each other in the US as a whole. Okay, so let's start by looking at the nature of intergenerational mobility in Salt Lake City, Utah. Uh, what this chart is plotting is the average percentile rank a child reaches versus their parents' percentile in the national income distribution. So for instance, if you look at the very top here, people in the top 1% of the income distribution, kids born to parents in the top 1%, we see that in Salt Lake City, they reach something like the 65th or 66th percentile on average. And likewise, you can see what this relationship looks like at all other income levels. Now the fact that this, uh, this is upward sloping shows you that there's significant intergenerational persistence. If you're born to richer parents, you're more likely to have a high income yourself. So one interesting property of this relationship, which turns out to be systematically true across all areas we've looked at, across a number of countries over time and so on, is that this looks almost like a perfect straight line, uh, which is, you know, doesn't necessarily have to be true, but it turns out for some reason that intergenerational mobility when measured in ranks is extremely linear like this. So we can compare Salt Lake City. Um, so, so you know, one feature of that linearity is that we can predict uh, the mean outcome for uh, any given child with parents at a percentile p using the slope and the intercept of this line, right? So given that this is a completely linear relationship, you can summarize it with just two parameters. Where does it hit? Uh, what's the intercept, what's the value at zero, and what is the slope of this relationship. And using that, you can predict uh, children's outcomes at any part of the income distribution. So for concreteness, in a lot of what I'm gonna show you, we're gonna focus in particular on the mean outcome for children with parents at the 25th percentile. So you can pick any percentile you want. The 25th percentile reflects kind of low income families. On average, how well do those kids do? And so you can see in uh, Salt Lake City, the um, average income rank that children who start out at the 25th percentile reach is 46.1. So they reach on average the 46th percentile. So that's, you can see, you know, fairly impressive level of upward mobility in the sense that you're starting out in a family at the 25th percentile, relatively low income, and you're getting pretty close to the median on average. Uh, to give you a sense of, you know, dollar magnitudes, the 46th percentile for children at age 30 in the US corresponds to an income of roughly $30,000. So now let's compare Salt Lake City to Charlotte, North Carolina, which as you'll remember from the map I showed you initially was one of the cities in the very dark red colors, very ro low rates of upward mobility. So you look at this relationship in Charlotte, North Carolina, you see that it's much steeper. Uh, and so as a result, Kids who are in low-income families in Charlotte, North Carolina, if they're at the start out at the 25th percentile, they reach only the 36th percentile on average, which corresponds to an income of $21,000. So there's nearly, nearly a $10,000 gap in annual income on average between kids growing up basically at the same income level in Charlotte 
and in Salt Lake City. Okay, so quite substantial differences in low-income children's outcomes uh, based on uh, acro across these two cities. Now, one interesting feature of the data, which turns out to be generically true across all places, is if you look at the top of the income distribution, you don't see much of a difference between these two places. So a different way to put it is that if you're rich, it doesn't seem to matter much where you're growing up. You're, you're, if you're in a rich family, your outcomes look basically the same if you grow up in Salt Lake City and if you grow up in Charlotte. It's really if you're poor that you see this big gap emerging. And that's true not just of this comparison between, between Salt Lake City and Charlotte. That turns out to be a very systematic property of the data uh, that we find, that where you grow up really matters if you're poor, not so much if you're rich. OK, so now generalizing from those measures, I showed you how we compute the average outcomes of children in low-income families in uh, Salt Lake City and in Charlotte. So now we do that for all the places in the US, and we compute the predicted income rank at age 26, in this case, for children with parents at the 25th percentile. And you can see you get a picture very similar to what I showed you initially, where you looked at uh, the fraction of children who make it to the top fifth conditional on the bottom fifth. So you can see that with this more comprehensive approach to measuring intergenerational mobility, you get essentially the same story that we started out with when we looked at that one particular statistic, which is why we started with that statistic. It's actually representative of intergenerational mobility more broadly, the geographical variation in intergenerational mobility. So the takeaway from this is that there's really robust systematic variation in children's outcomes across areas, particularly for low-income kids. So what I want to turn to next is start to understand what's driving that geographic variation across areas. And so in particular, I'm going to focus on distinguishing two very different explanations for the variation in children's outcomes across places. The first is heterogeneity. Different people live in different places. So of course, the demographic structure, for instance, of Atlanta is very different from the demographic structure of San Francisco. There are more African Americans. There are fewer immigrants. There are different education levels. There are all kinds of things that are different about the people living in these different cities. And so one possibility is that you know, while we're seeing this geographic variation, it's not really fundamentally about the place in which you're growing up. It's really fundamentally about the people in those places. I think that's a perfectly plausible uh, explanation. And if that were the case, this would point you in a very different direction in thinking about this problem. You would want to think about people-based policies, if you'd like, instead of place-based policies, because the place would sort of just be an, you know, an ancillary thing related to which people happen to live in different places. Now, a very different explanation, which sociologists have um, thought is important for a very long time, going back at least to the work of William Julius Wilson in the 1980s and, and even before that, is the idea that places have a causal effect on upward mobility for a given person. So this is the idea that you know, where you grow up really matters, or to, you know, it's often summarized as neighborhood effects. Your, your neighborhood really affects your long-term outcomes. Okay? And so if this is what's going on, uh, then you know, that could suggest potentially a place-based approach to, imp uh, to improving opportunity. Maybe there's something actually wrong with institutions or conditions in Atlanta that we can try to fix that's going to lead to better outcomes for kids. And that would call for a very different set of policy approaches. So there's been a lot of work in social science over the past 30 years in sociology and in economics trying to distinguish between these two explanations. But I think that literature has been largely inconclusive, and there's a lot of debate, um, mostly because there's been inadequate data to really discern these two explanations very precisely. So in uh, recent work, we revisit that question, try to identify the causal effects of place. It's useful to start by thinking about what the ideal experiment you would run would be, you would run in order to test between these two theories, right? So ideally, what you do is that you'd randomly assign children to all of the different areas, the 740 areas I was showing you. You'd randomly assign them to different places from birth. You'd compare their outcomes in adulthood. And if you saw significant differences, you could conclude with confidence that you know, there are causal effects of place. Where you grow up actually matters. So obviously, running an experiment like that is not practical. Uh, and so what we're going to do in this study that I'll describe with Nathan Hendren 
is approximate that experiment using a quasi-experimental design. What you'll see here is basically that, again, because of the large data sets that, that we now have in the US and many other countries, uh, we can set up things that look essentially like the ideal experiment that you would like to run and reach conclusions that are almost as credible as what you'd get from a true randomized experiment, the gold standard. So what we're gonna do is study seven million families who move across areas in observational data, meaning data where there's no experiment, just moves that happen to occur for, for whatever reason. And the key idea is that we're going to exploit variation in the age of the child when the family moves in order to identify the causal effects of environment. So we recognize that where a family chooses to move is of course not random. So you can't just compare the outcomes of children whose families chose to move to San Francisco versus the outcomes of children whose families chose to move to Atlanta. Those are gonna to be two very different types of families. So just comparing people who move to different places is not adequate. What we're gonna exploit is the fact that there's a lot of variation in the age of the child when people make these moves, and we think you can learn quite a bit from that. So before going into some more of the statistical detail to explain how we do this, uh, let me first give you a simple example that essentially illustrates uh, the core idea. So let's take a set of families. Imagine we take a set of families that uh, start out in Manhattan. And suppose if you grow up in Manhattan from birth, uh, you have an income to pick a round number of $30,000 on average when you're 30 years old. So say if you grew up from birth in Manhattan in a low income family, you're earning $30,000 on average. Now suppose you have a set of families that move from Manhattan to Queens, and you'll remember from the maps that I was showing you initially, Queens looks much better in terms of low-income kids' outcomes than Manhattan. So again, to pick a round number, suppose if you grow up in Queens from birth, you earn $40,000 on average at age 30. So now, think about a family that moves from Manhattan to Queens with kids of different ages. And let's start by looking at families who move when their child is exactly nine years old. So why age nine? It turns out that that is the earliest age we're able to look at with currently available data in the US, okay? And so if we look at these people who move when they're exactly age nine and track them forward 21 years and look at how much they are earning when they're 30 years old, we see that they end up roughly halfway between the kids who grew up in Manhattan from birth and the kids who grew up in Queens from birth. That is, they're earning about $35,000 when we look at their incomes at age 30. So that's for the kids who move when they're exactly nine years old. So now let's replicate that analysis, looking at kids who move when they're 10, 11, 12, 13, and so on. And you see this very clear declining pattern. The later you make that move from Manhattan to Queens, the less of the gain you get from growing up in Queens. And if you move in your uh, early 20s, you essentially get no gain at all. And if you move after your 22 or so, there's absolutely no impact. So what do you see in this chart? I think there are three key lessons. First, under the set of identification assumptions, which I will come to in, in a minute and describe you know, what's going on in the background here, what assumptions are we making? Uh, the, the first thing you can see is that this evidence is consistent with the idea that place matters. It's not just that the kids who live in Manhattan are different from the kids who live in Queens. Apparently, if you take a given child and move that child from Harlem, say, in Manhattan, to Queens, you see different outcomes for that given child. And so that, as I was saying earlier, is an extremely important uh, result because it suggests that environment really matters, right? It's not just that there are differences in the types of kids living in these different places. You can actually do something about it in particular, when people move, you see really different outcomes. And so that raises the possibility that we might be able to change conditions in Manhattan in order to improve children's outcomes substantially. So that's the first point, place matters. Second, why does place matter? This data suggests that it matters because of childhood environment as opposed to differences in the environment in adulthood. So you know, one set of factors you might think about are differences in the types of jobs that are available in an area, or differences in labor market conditions, which surely matter at the national level for economic outcomes. But at uh, this local area level, moving to a different place you know, when you're a young adult really doesn't do much for you. It's really about moving when you're a child. And so that points in the direction of 
childhood environment really being a critical determinant of children's long-term outcomes. The third point you see is that this relationship is roughly linear, meaning every extra year of exposure to a better environment uh, improves your outcomes by roughly the same amount, about 4% per year for uh, exposure to a better place. Why is that important? So as you, many of you might know, there's a lot of discussion at the moment about early childhood interventions, the idea that we really need to intervene in the earliest years of a child's life in order to be, be able to help them do better in the long run. These data are not uh, particularly consistent with that view because they suggest that if you move to a better area when you're 10 instead of, when you're nine instead of 10 or when you're 14 instead of 15, those marginal changes continue to help you quite a bit. A better environment is helpful even in adolescence, apparently, uh, according to this analysis. And th so that suggests that there's no reason to sort of give up on kids after they're three or four years old. You can continue to help children throughout uh, their childhood, okay? So let me now describe uh, what's going on behind that analysis in a little bit more detail so you can get a sense of uh, you know, what's going on here and how we reach this conclusion. Um, so to, to begin, to make this a little bit more precise, uh, let's consider families who move with a child who is exactly 13 years old. And let's compare the earnings in adulthood, which we're gonna measure typically between the ages of 24 and 30, of two children who start in the same city, but move to different cities at age 13. So to make this concrete, let's say you take two kids who start out in Dallas, Texas, which is a place with average mobility in the US. One of them moves to San Francisco, which for kids in the 1980s had very high levels of mobility. And one of them, let's say, moves to Atlanta. And so let's start by comparing these kids' outcomes. So that's what we do in this chart here. What this chart is plotting is on the x-axis, the predicted difference in the child's rank based on the permanent residence in the destination to which they moved relative to the origin. So the places on the far right over here are, th so the, the people who are on the far right, like the plus six, they are people who are moving from a place like Dallas to a place like San Francisco, a place with much higher levels of upward mobility. The places on the far left, you can think of that as moving to a place like Atlanta, where the permanent residents, meaning the people who already lived in that place, they had much worse outcomes on average. And what you can see is we're plotting the average outcome of the kids who moved, essentially, on the y-axis. Uh, how well did they do relative to the national average? And you can see that if you move to a place like uh, San Francisco on the far right here, uh, when you were 13 years old, you yourself are doing much better when we measure your income in adulthood. And if you move to a place like uh, Atlanta, you yourself are doing much worse in adulthood, uh, uh, again, for kids who move at age 13. The slope of this line is about 0.6. So the way to interpret that is if you move to a place where people are doing one unit better, they end up where they're uh, earning one percentile point higher on average, you get about 0.6 percentiles of that effect if you move when you're exactly 13 years old. So now what we do is replicate the analysis that we did here for age 13 for all the other ages that we're able to see in the data, starting at age nine. And so the dot that I showed you for age 13 is highlighted in red here. That's that 0.62 number. Uh, and then we similarly estimate that slope at all other ages. And you see that pattern that I was describing to you in the example of this declining set of effects followed by a flat relationship beyond a certain age, beyond age 23 or so. Okay, so uh, more precisely, there are two key patterns that you see in these data. The first is at older ages, after age 24, and I should note, in this particular case, we're measuring income at age 24, okay? So we see that if your parents move to a better area after age 24, you still seem to pick up 0.2, 20% of the effect of the area to which they moved. So that, if you think about it, that of course cannot be a causal effect, right? Because what this is saying is if your parents move to a better place when you're 26 years old, your income at age 24 appears to be higher. So obviously that can't uh, be, be a causal effect itself. And so we interpret this as just a selection effect 
reflecting exactly the idea that the types of parents who move to a city like San Francisco or cities with high levels of upward mobility, those are different families from the families that end up, that, that choose to move to areas with lower levels of social mobility, okay? So that reflects the fact that there is some selection in the data. The pattern that we concentrate on is that here, before age 23, you see this very sharp declining pattern in these coefficients, consistent with the idea that exposure matters. Every extra year that you spend in this better environment, your own outcomes seem to converge to the outcomes of the kids who were already there. And by the way, I'm emphasizing better environment. This works totally symmetrically if you think about moving to a worse environment. If you move to a one unit worse environment, kids' outcomes fall in exactly the same proportion. It's totally symmetric, okay? So what we're interested in is this exposure pattern on the left, but you can see that there are also these selection effects that is moving is not actually random, you know, perhaps not surprisingly, which is what you see on the right. So to make progress, uh, what we first do is note that the average selection effect here on the right side is 0.23, meaning when you move to a 10% uh, better place, 2.3% of that appears to be a pure selection effect, just differences in family characteristics that are leading to different child outcomes. Now the critical assumption we make to, in order to make this analysis work is that the selection effect that we see here does not vary with the age at which you move to a better place. So in other words, it could well be true that the types of families who move to San Francisco are different from the types of families who move to Atlanta. That's fine for our analysis, but we are gonna require that the extent to which that's true doesn't vary with the child's age at the point of the move. So the extent to which different types of parents are moving to San Francisco has to be the same at age 10 or 15 as it is at age 20 or 25, okay? If you make that assumption, uh, then you can basically draw this selection effect out like a horizontal line going all the way back. And you can then interpret the difference between these dots and that horizontal line as the causal effect of moving to that area at a given age, right? Because you've basically subtracted out the portion of it that's due to the fact that there's selection, it's due to the fact that there are different people moving to different places, okay? So that's the fundamental logic of our approach. We're gonna rely on this difference in the age at which people move under the assumption that the age at which they move is unrelated to these selection effects. And I'm gonna come back in a second to talk about whether we think that assumption is a good assumption or not, okay? So uh, under that assumption, what we can see is that these coefficients here uh, uh, are declining linearly in the age at which you move, uh, showing exactly what I was saying with that initial example. Every extra year contributes roughly equally to a child's outcomes. There's no evidence of a critical age effect, meaning you, know, you don't have to get to a place by a certain age in order to really achieve the gains. Every extra year contributes roughly equally. What is the slope of that line? The slope of that line is minus 0.038, which means that every year of exposure gets you roughly a 3.8% effect. Children's outcomes converge to those of the people in the destination to which they move at about a 3.8% or 4% rate per year. And so that implies that if you have 20 years of exposure, let's say 20 years of childhood, 20 years of exposure, to a better area, you're gonna pick up something like 75 or 80% of the variation that we saw in those initial maps uh, from moving to those, from moving to a different place, okay? So 75 or 80% of that variance in the initial map appears to be due to the causal effect of the place under this assumption that the selection effect is not varying with the age at which you move, okay? Now, the, the key assumption here as I've been emphasizing, is that the timing of moves to better or worse areas is uncorrelated with children's potential outcomes. So, uh, you know, that assumption is a strong assumption, and you can see, you know, why it's a strong assumption, by thinking about the ways in which it might be violated. There are two ways in which this critical assumption that we need for our analysis might be violated. The first is that parents who move to good areas when their children are young might invest more in their children in other ways. So you know, think about it intuitively, like take a set of families that choose to move from uh, 
move out of Atlanta, let's say, when their children are relatively young, maybe those parents are in more concerned about their kids, maybe they're more educated, more sophisticated, maybe that's why their children end up doing better in their long run relative to parents who move when their children are older who maybe took longer to figure it out. So that, if we had that kind of effect, that would contaminate the analysis that I'm showing you and the slope of 4% per year that we're estimating would be a biased estimate of the causal effect of, of each place. A second potential problem is that moving might be correlated with other factors, for instance, a change in your level of income or a change in the type of job you have or whether you're married or not, that could affect the child directly. So when you make that move maybe to San Francisco, maybe the parent also gets a much better job at the same time, and it's that better job that's affecting the child not being in San Francisco, right? So that would also confound our analysis. So let me, you know, without going to too much of the detail here, just explain at a high level how we deal with these two problems. We use two approaches to basically show that that basic assumption of constant selection effects seems to be valid. The first is that we uh, compare between siblings within a given family by putting in family fixed effects in this analysis. So the idea here is very simple. If we're really concerned that the types of families who move when their children are young are different from the types of families who move when children are older, one way we can get around that problem is by comparing brothers and sisters within the same family, right? So take the example of moving from Manhattan to Queens. If we now take a family with two kids and compare the outcomes of the child who was nine years old when the family moved with, say, his older brother, who was 12 years old or 13 years old when the family moved, do we see that the nine-year-old is doing better than the 12-year-old uh, on average, right? Which is what we'd expect if this exposure really matters. And it turns out that that's exactly the pattern you see in the data. So this chart here, which looks almost identical to the chart that I was showing you earlier, now includes family fixed effects, meaning it's identified purely off of comparisons within family, purely off of sibling comparisons. And you see a remarkably similar pattern, a slope of roughly minus 4% per year. Basically what this is telling you is you take a child, take a family with two kids, you know, one who's nine, one who's 15, you do in fact see that the nine-year-old is gaining more from any given move to a better area than the 15-year-old. So that, I think, totally takes off the table any concern one might have that these, are driven, that these results are driven by differences in the types of families that are moving when children are young versus old, because this is comparing kids within the same families, okay? Now, the second set of issues that something else is changing at the same time, that's a little bit harder to deal with. Uh, and so we do a number of things. We control for changes in family income, control for changes in family status around the time of the move, and we show that that doesn't affect the estimates at all. But the evidence that ultimately convinced me that this really looks like the causal effect of place comes from a set of outcome-based placebo tests that exploit heterogeneity in these place effects across different groups. So there's a lot of variation across groups by gender, by where you are in the income distribution, by quantile, and by birth cohort. And that allows you to implement powerful uh, tests of whether this causal exposure effect model is really true. So let me give you one concrete example. So it turns out uh, in the data that uh, there are some places that are particularly good for boys and there are other places that are particularly good for girls. So in general, places that are good for boys also tend to be good for girls, but there are some exceptions to that. So for instance, if you take places uh, with very high crime rates, uh, the city of Baltimore, for example, has very high levels of crime. Those kinds of places tend to have particularly negative uh, outcomes for boys, perhaps because they get involved in crime, end up in jail, uh, and so forth. So we can exploit the fact that there is this variation across genders and think about the following thought experiment. Suppose you have a family now that moves with a son and a daughter uh, to, from place A to place B. And suppose they happen to move to a place uh, where boys are doing particularly well. What we see in the data is that their son's outcomes improve at a 4% rate per year of exposure when they move to this place, but their daughter's outcomes don't change at all. And so, you know, that very precise convergence by gender and also across various other dimensions to the outcomes of the people already living there 
that's hard to reconcile with some other factor, you know, like getting a better job. Why would, why would getting a better job have differential effects based on the gender of your children within your family? That would be kind of peculiar. And so this sort of evidence uh, really leads us to think that this appears to be the causal effect of where you're growing up as opposed to some other confounding set of factors, okay? Uh, so to summarize, the key lesson to take away from this section of the talk is that roughly 70 or 80 percent of the variation in uh, children's outcomes across areas appears to be due to the causal effects of where you're growing up uh, and in moving to a place with higher rates of upward mobility improves a given child's uh, chances of success in proportion to the amount of time they're exposed to that place. Okay. So childhood environment really seems to matter. So the third and last thing I want to talk about today is what is it about these places that we now have established apparently cause better outcomes? What is it that's systematically different about these brighter colored areas relative to the dark red areas on the map? You know, what's the recipe for success, if you'd like, in places with high levels of mobility? Why do some places produce much better outcomes for disadvantaged kids than others? And the hope is that by learning from these data, perhaps we can draw generalizable lessons that would apply here in the UK or, or elsewhere around the world. So this is a very, very difficult question to answer. It's a question we're working on and a number of other people are working on at the moment, figuring out what that recipe is. What I'm gonna do here as a first step is begin by characterizing the features of areas with high rates of upward mobility. So do basically a correlational analysis and tell you about the properties of places that seem to have high rates of upward mobility relative to low rates of upward mobility, which is gonna give us a first pass sense of what the causal mechanisms, what the recipe might actually be. So we've looked at a number of factors uh, that correlate with these differences in mobility. You know, we've looked at various theories that economists and sociologists have thought about over the years. In the interest of time, I'm gonna focus here on the five strongest predictors of these differences in upward mobility across areas that we find. The first is segregation. We find that places that are more segregated by race or by income have significantly lower levels of, of upward mobility. Now there are many different ways to measure segregation. There are many different statistical indices that you can use. But it turns out that the patterns here are so stark that you can just see them visually in the data. So let me give you a couple of examples. This map here depicts racial segregation in the Atlanta metro area. The way it's constructed is using census data. Each person in Atlanta is represented by a dot, and the dots are colored so that whites are blue, blacks are green, Asians are red, and Hispanics are orange. And you can see immediately that Atlanta is an incredibly segregated city. The blue dots are in a completely different part of the city, the northern side of the city, relative to the green dots, which are down here, the red dots, the Asians are concentrated in one other part, and the Hispanics are up here, right? So there's absolutely no interaction in terms of uh, you know, where you live between blacks and whites and other racial and ethnic groups. And so Atlanta and cities that look like it in terms of the degree of residential segregation have some of the lowest levels of upward mobility uh, in the United States, right? So now in contrast, look at Sacramento, California which has the same minority share as Atlanta, the same fraction of blacks and Hispanics as Atlanta. You can see immediately that Sacramento is a much more integrated city than Atlanta, right? The colors are much more interspersed in this map. And corresponding to that, Sacramento and cities that look like it have much higher rates of upward mobility uh, in, in the US as a whole. So that's the first strong pattern. Segregation is strongly negatively correlated with differences uh, with, with upward mobility. So why might that be? There are a number of different mechanisms that could be at play here. So one could be exposure and peer effects and role models that, that affect your aspirations, for instance. So if you live in a city like this, you're not gonna come into contact with people of different socioeconomic backgrounds, of different racial backgrounds, and maybe that affects your outlook as a child in terms of the set of career paths you consider uh, or you know, the set of influences you have in your life. Another potential explanation is when you have a city that looks like this, given that schools are funded based on local property taxes in the US, you end up with much less funding for public schools for minority kids or low-income kids 
in cities that are segregated relative to cities that are integrated. And so there could be a variety of mechanisms that could be driving this link between segregation and upward mobility. We don't know exactly what the pathway is, but what we can say is there's a very strong association between segregation and rates of social mobility. The second strong correlation in the data is with income inequality. We find that places with a smaller middle class tend to have much lower levels of social mobility. So this correlation suggests that the level of inequality within a generation at any given point in time is strongly related to children's prospects of moving up the income distribution across generations. So there's potentially a link between income inequality and intergenerational mobility. And I think that is interesting and potentially concerning as we have growing inequality in the US and the UK and many other countries, we, we should worry perhaps that that's gonna also further level uh, rates of social mobility if there's in fact a causal relationship between these two factors. The third and fourth factors I'm gonna talk about uh, come more from, uh, so sorry, so the, the third factor is more from the education literature, you know, as you might uh, expect intuitively. Uh, places with better public schools tend to have significantly better outcomes for kids from low-income families. So this is a little bit difficult to establish because measuring the quality of public schools systematically, given the data we have, is somewhat challenging. But if you use whatever measures we're able to construct, like levels of expenditures, class size, test scores, we find that places with better public schools seem to systematically have better outcomes uh, for kids in low-income families, which I think is intuitive might be what you expect. The last two factors I'm gonna talk about come more from the sociology literature. So the single strongest correlation we find uh, is with measures of family structure. We find that areas with more single parents have significantly lower levels of upward mobility. Now in interpreting this correlation, it's important to note that this is not purely driven by the fact that if you grew up in a single parent household, you have worse outcomes. And the way you can see that is if we take the set of kids whose own parents are married, so suppose your own parents are married, but you live in an area with a lot of single parents. We find that those kids have significantly lower prospects of climbing the income ladder, even though their own parents are married, right? So again, it points to a community level factor. It's picking up something about what varies across communities and not literally what's going on in your own family. Finally, related to that, we find that differences in social capital across cities uh, predict these differences in mobility. So the social capital, the, the way I think about it is it captures, the, it's well captured by the old adage that it takes a village to raise a child. So social capital is basically the idea of whether someone else will help you out in your community, even if you are not doing well. Salt Lake City with the Mormon church is thought to be a classic example of a city with a lot of social capital and correspondingly has very high rates of social mobility. Now this idea of social capital was popularized by Bob Putnam at Harvard uh, in a well-known book called Bowling Alone. And the reason for the title of uh, Bob's book is that you know, social capital is a, is a very difficult thing to measure and Bob used the number of bowling alleys in an area and in particular whether people were bowling alone as a proxy for social capital. So I was surprised to find, I actually remember being in uh, Bob Putnam's office discussing this with him. We, we found in our own data that the number of bowling alleys is very strongly correlated with rates of upward mobility, in fact. Uh, the reason I mention that here is that it illustrates well a caveat to everything that I'm showing you on this slide, which is that these are correlations rather than causal effects, right? So I'd be surprised if the policy lesson from this is that we should build more bowling alleys to increase uh, upward mobility. And so that's where I'm gonna, gonna end today. I think these five factors that I've described give us hints about where to look to improve social mobility, but by no means do they identify causal mechanisms or policy tools. And so tomorrow, I'm gonna ask what policies can we actually implement to increase rates of upward mobility? So I'll stop there.
Okay, great, thanks. Um, so we've got time for some questions. Um, so who'd, who'd like to ask questions? Uh, I think we've got a roving microphone somewhere. Have we? Yeah. So was somebody down here? Should we, should we accumulate a few? Should we do it that way? I'm happy to answer. Well, we can see. Hello. Oh, no. Let's do, let's do them one by one. Okay. Okay. Uh, Raj, thank you for the presentation. Congratulations for a fantastic project. Uh, I was hoping you would mention that uh, one of the strong correlates of upward mobility is commute time. That's one of the findings in your paper. I would like to pick your brain on what do you think could be the mechanisms uh, involved in that. Because if, if I understood it correctly, the commute time you were analyzing is based on the 2010 census, exactly. So this would be kind of a, a backwards uh, correlation slash causal effect. How, how, what would you think about yeah. that? So, so that's correct. Uh, we find a strong correlation between commute times and rates of upward mobility, and we put that loosely in the segregation category because we find that cities that are more sprawling, so they have you know, higher average commute times is one way to measure it from your home to your workplace. Cities like Atlanta, for example, have very high average commute times. These types of cities also tend to be much more segregated. So basically car cities are more segregated. Cities that have more public transit uh, tend to be uh, less segregated and a little bit more dense and compact. And so when I think about how to improve, interpret the commute time cor uh, correlation, there are two different channels you might think about. So one is that you're picking up segregation, basically, right? That places with higher commute times, what's going on is that they're actually more segregated. And I talked about how segregation, you know, through various pathways could influence upward mobility. A different possibility is that public transit and access to jobs and access to opportunities literally matters. So, you know, that would suggest if we build more public transit and actually make uh, you know, commuting make places more accessible to people that that would have a significant causal effect. I don't think we can say with the data we have at the moment which of those two explanations is correct. One of the things we're doing going forward is putting out all the data that I've been showing you. Actually, all the data I've been showing you is publicly available on a website, equalityofopportunity.org, and we're collecting this data over time in a panel by, by cohort. And so the hope is you can look at public infrastructure projects, for instance, you know, maybe some city built a better metro system. Does that have an effect on outcomes downstream? I think that type of analysis would be very useful, but at the moment, I don't think we can say exactly what the answer is. Okay, I think we had one down here. Hi, thank you. Um, I live here. I describe myself as a Democratic voter from Wyoming. <laughs> Wyoming looked like it has massive social mobility. There's hardly any people there. Mm -hmm. There's not a lot of economic opportunity there. Yeah. What is that about? Yeah, great question. So, <laughs> so what's going on in places like Wyoming, much of the rural um, you know, middle of the country, uh, is precisely that people are moving to different places in adulthood to achieve these higher incomes. So that's why I was emphasizing at the beginning that we're classifying people into locations based on where they grew up rather than where they live in adulthood. So a lot of the kids who make it to say the top 20% of the national income distribution who are growing up in Wyoming, they are living in Chicago or in New York when we're measuring their incomes in adulthood. Can I ask? Um, knowing how a lot of kids in a rural area grow up doing chores, giving responsibility real early for doing stuff, um, shoveling snow, taking care of cattle, yeah. um, and that's a reality there, as yeah. you know. Does that have something to do with a child's it, it attitudes could well in a city be. So, later? you know, taking care of cattle and other factors <laughs> like that are obviously difficult to examine systematically, but, you know, the, I take the gist of your question as does being kind of industrious and having to do all those things while you're growing up uh, have a significant effect? I think it could well be that. It could also be, you know, the, the five factors that I was describing, they line up well with explaining why rural areas actually do quite well in terms of rates of upward mobility, like the center of the country. So in particular, if you think historically about where some of the best schools in the U.S. were, it's in places like Iowa, or you think about places with the greatest social capital where people kind of know each other in their small town, it's these kinds of places. Or if you think about segregation, in a big city, you can segregate yourself from other people by sending your kids to a private school and things like that. When you're in a small town, 
there's no capacity to do that. And so you, you know, basically have integration. So I think all of the factors I was describing, you know, fit the pattern as well, but you could be right that there are other things in these rural areas that contribute to it as well. Thank you. Okay, let's go for a bit of upward mobility. There's a question up top there. <laughs> So you commented on a family, or two families rather, who start off in Texas, one moves to San Francisco and does well, and one moves the other way to Atlanta and does badly. I wonder if you're able to take it a stage further and imagine those same two families where the children then both migrate to the same place. Mm. So as young adults, they both migrate to, say, New York. Do you still find that the family from San Francisco do better, in which case I'm much more confident that it's the locality and the education, etc.? Yeah. Or do you find that having moved to New York, in fact, the, the, the effects disappear? Yeah, great question. So we have done uh, precisely that analysis. You know, the way you'd say that econometrically is put in the child's current residence fixed effects, so control for where the child is currently living, and you find roughly 70 to 75% of the effect remains. Uh, now, that analysis, the reason you don't, we don't use that as our main approach is because where you move is an endogenous outcome, of course, right? And so you don't, in a sense, want to control for that. One of the ways in which you might do well, going back to the earlier question, is precisely by having the opportunity to move to New York. And so it's not clear that you want to control for it, but the fact that when you control for it, you still see the effect is reassuring for exactly the reason you said. Okay, there's a question in red at the back. Person in red. Thank you, Professor. Uh, my question is, uh, was it or is it possible uh, to look at the effects of emotional well-being uh, or stress uh, in uh, impacting intergenerational mobility? Yeah. yeah, that's a good question. I think things like emotional well-being and stress are likely to be very important, particularly in childhood. So there's growing evidence from research other people have done, often using Scandinavian data, which are well suited to study these kinds of questions, um, that stress, maternal stress, for example, uh, when kids are born, or stress that kids experience in childhood because their parents lose their job or because of divorce, they have these long-term scarring effects that are, that are quite substantial. And intuitively, I don't know if this has really been documented systematically, uh, low-income families have many more of these stressors than higher-income families, right? And so I do think that that can accumulate and have uh, quite a significant effect and perhaps explain some of these differences that we're seeing across places, that maybe in some places you're effectively more insulated than others. So I think that's a very interesting hypothesis to think about more. It's difficult to examine it systematically in the data we have because you can't measure stress for every family in the way uh, that you'd like to. But you know, hopefully going forward, if you can link health records to the type of data that I was showing you here, you'd be able to make progress on those issues. Okay, back upstairs again. Hi, thank you. Um, Pfizer from Class Think Tank. Uh, just a couple of things, just to pick up on your point about single parents, and I just wondered if you could just talk a bit about that. I was just wondering if that's capturing something else, say poverty or, or, or perhaps something else that's underlying that. Um, and then I guess to ask you a question about the concept of social mobility, I think for some of us we get a bit frustrated that it's almost the ultimate measure of how great society is if you can move up. Um, and some of us have a problem with that in that it means that some people will always remain at the bottom or there's some issue that as long as you can move up then everything's fine. Um, and I just wondered if you could talk a bit about whether you think that is a good measure mm -hmm. of how well we're doing in society. Yeah. Uh, so let's start with the first question on single parents. So I think that correlation is again, you know, a little bit tricky to interpret. So one interpretation is that it could be about family stability, which also I think relates to the stress question. One way in which you might have more stress is if you're in an unstable environment. Uh, you know, another way in which family stability can matter, uh, there's growing evidence that the presence of a father in a household is particularly important for boys' outcomes. So we see that these areas with a large number of single parents, boys' outcomes look particularly bad in those places relative to girls, which is consistent with the idea that having a male role model uh, figure is really important for boys' developmental outcomes. So that's kind of the causal interpretation of that correlation. But it could also be that single parenthood is just an outcome 
much like social mobility. So maybe there's some root factor, like the quality of schools or segregation, that leads kids to make very different choices. And one of the choices they make is in relation to their income and human capital investments, and other choices they make are related to fertility patterns and teenage pregnancy and other things like divorce and marriage. And maybe the types of factors that lead to better economic outcomes also lead to better social outcomes. And so that's why I think it's hard to know exactly, again, what to make of that correlation. You don't know if it's a direct effect running from that factor to the economic outcomes or some third thing that's causing both of them. Um, on the second question of you know, whether social mobility is a good measure to look at, this is what I'm going to talk about a little bit more in the, in the later lectures as well. I don't think it's necessarily obvious that social mobility as defined by moving up or down in ranks is a good thing because, of course, in ranks, if somebody moves up in percentile, somebody else has got to be coming down. And so you have to have upward mobility in a sense. In order to have upward mobility, you also have to have downward mobility. And so while I think most people would agree that a society with no mobility is probably not desirable, where your parents basically determine your destiny, I think few of us would think that that's a good system. It's also not obvious that a society with perfect relative mobility is a desirable society, because one way you could achieve that is just through random allocations. Suppose we didn't pay any attention to how much anyone works, and we just randomly distribute people, distribute income, right? That would have perfect mobility, in a sense, because your outcome would be completely unrelated to your parents' income. But I think most people would also think that level of social mobility is not necessarily desirable. So it's a tricky, I think, issue figuring out what the right level of social mobility is. And I think, in particular, as I'll talk about later, thinking about concepts of absolute mobility defined in dollars I think makes things a little bit clearer rather than these relative measures. So I'll have more to say about that in the subsequent lectures. Hi. Thanks for taking questions. And all of the measures you were comparing people to others nationally, did you look at all or did you see any effects for having a smaller or larger pro portion of people in a given area that are in the bottom 20% nationally? So, for example, somebody in the 20th percentile living in Harlem is living a very different life than somebody in the yep. bottom 20th percentile nationally yeah. in a very rural area. Yeah, and, and so, yes, the answer is yes, that if you are in an area with a lot of other low-income people, uh, you do see lower levels of upward mobility in the national distribution, like Harlem, for example. And that's picked up in the correlations that I was showing you in both the income inequality measures and the segregation measures, right? So if you have a lot of people in the bottom 20%, uh, then you're more likely to be a place with a lot of inequality because the income distribution is likely to be more widely distributed. You're also more likely to be in a place that's segregated or has a lot of concentrated poverty. I think the segregation correlation is basically picking up the fact that if you grow up in a neighborhood with a lot of concentrated poverty, then you tend to have worse outcomes. So there's another one, a couple, a couple down as well. Somebody else up behind up. Hi, I was just wondering, sometimes you looked at the outcome uh, for the children when he was 30 years old, and I wonder if you replicated that for, say, 50 years old, and if you found significant differences or not. Yeah. So uh, we're not able to look out to age 50, given the time span of the data. The data we're using spans about 17 years, and so you can't look at 50-year-olds, basically. But what we are able to do is with smaller samples get out to age 35 or age 40, uh, and basically the reason we're comfortable using measures at age 30 is we find that these outcomes stabilize, in particular your percentile rank in the income distribution stabilizes roughly by age 30. So if you look at uh, people's ranks when they're say in their you know, mid-20s, for instance, it's too early. Uh, you know, as many of the students here uh, probably hope your incomes now don't reflect your incomes later on. Uh, and so by age 30, most of that process has been completed. There are still some people in school, but it's a relatively small number. And so your relative rank in the distribution compared to other 30-year-olds is more or less stable at that point. And so we think the results, if we were able to take it out to age 50, based on that logic, would not look very different because we don't see them very changing very much when we go from 30 to 35 to 40. Was, was that a hand up there? Yeah, I think so. 
Hi, thank you very much for your lecture. Um, so without wishing to go through all of the reasons that there might be similarities and reasons for social mobility, I, I have another one to chuck at you that I'd be interested to hear your thoughts. Um, have you looked at the sort of obesity diet and maybe the way to correlate that would be how old people, the average age people live to? Yeah, and uh, interestingly, you know, we've done uh, another project, which I'm not going to talk about in these lectures, on health inequality, looking exactly at measures of life expectancy by area and by income. So in a recent study published in the Journal of the American Medical Association, we have similar maps looking at health inequality as based on life expectancy. And you find associations with the mobility measures that I'm showing you here. The two measures are not perfectly correlated, but in general, the places that have higher levels of intergenerational mobility also have smaller gaps in life expectancy. You see remarkably large gaps in life expectancy in the US as a whole. So the, between the, the richest men in the United States live on average 15 years longer than the poorest men in the United States. So it's an incredibly large gap, but that gap is considerably smaller in some places like San Francisco, for example, has only a four or five year gap as opposed to a 15 year gap. And so it tends to be the, the higher mobility sorts of places, but not, not always. So there is an association between health inequality and economic opportunity. Go down here. Are you interested in the fact that the very, or the um, relationship between age and the benefit is linear? I would think that if education really mattered, that you would have kind of like a, a shift at either high school or other like elementary different times in which you entered school. Yeah, yeah, good question. You know, we'd like to be able to look at the elementary school question by looking at the data around age five, which we're not able to do at the moment. Uh, in terms of high school, sometimes it looks like there's a bit of a jump there, but you know, it does overall seem to be a pretty linear decline. And so that leads me to think, you know, it's not about a particular phase of school and it's not just about school. You know, that's not entirely what matters. It's consistent with some other evidence I'm gonna show you tomorrow that education matters, but other things matter as well. But even in the context of education, uh, for instance, if it's, for, say, the quality of the teachers you have, uh, the quality of the teachers can have an effect in fifth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade, high school. And our sense is those effects are roughly similar at different ages. Better teachers help you at older ages in ways that are similar to how they help you at younger ages, and that creates that linear pattern. Okay, we'll just take a couple more. There was one up at the top. There was two up at the top, actually, but I think they'll be the last two questions. Thanks for the talk. Uh, as mentioned by Prof just now that uh, there is upward mobility and there should be a corresponding downward mobility. Is there any evidence that the top 20% parents would do something to uh, restrain upward mobility in order to you know, protect the, their children's uh, position? Yeah. Uh, well, so the first thing to note is at the local area level, there's no direct trade-off between upward mobility and downward mobility, right? It's only in the national distribution as a whole because we're ranking people in the nation. So in particular, in a place like San Francisco where you had relatively high levels of upward mobility in the 1980s, you didn't have uh, you know, bad outcomes for kids in rich families because there's no one-for-one -one trade-off within any small uh, area. And so what you find in particular, you can draw a map for downward mobility. You can take the set of kids who grew up in high income families and ask how did their outcomes vary across areas. And the central thing you see, which I alluded to when I was comparing Charlotte and uh, Salt Lake City, is that that map shows much less variation across areas. Where you live just matters much less for downward mobility. It's much more uniform in terms of rates across places. Now you also asked, uh, whether the rich might be doing something to prevent downward mobility. In a sense, I think they're doing many things. Ki parents invest in their kids with their human capital, sending them to good schools, you know, all kinds of things in order to help their kids do as well as possible. In a sense, you can interpret that as preventing downward mobility, right? You're trying to uh, help your kids do as well as possible. So yes, I think, you know, whether it's consciously because they're concerned about 
uh, preventing downward mobility and they, they want to make sure their child secures their spot in the income distribution or directly because parents just want to invest in children, yeah, I absolutely think high income people do that. And uh, that gets back to the question of whether social mobility is a good measure. You know, I don't think we, we would think we want to restrict high income parents from investing in their kids. Naturally, they want to and their kids are better for it. I think it's more about how you improve opportunities for disadvantaged kids in an absolute sense that matters. Did you adjust your income data for factors like Medicaid availability or public housing or Section 8 vouchers, given that you know, I'm assuming that doesn't show up in people's tax reported income and doesn't yeah. matter at all? Yeah, so we've done some analysis looking at, we, you're right that we don't see that directly in the tax data, in-kind transfers, basically. Uh, we've done some analysis of whether places with different levels of mobility appear to have systematically different levels of in-kind transfers, and we don't find that much uh, of a relationship, and I think that's largely because a lot of the major in-kind transfer programs in the U.S., like Medicaid, like the housing voucher program, which I'm gonna talk about in the next lecture, actually, like food stamps, these tend to be national programs. And so there isn't gonna be a whole lot of variation and you know, it's not like you get lots of transfers in Chicago but not in New York. A lot of these programs are fairly uniform, not exactly uniform, but fairly uniform at national level. So I don't think that's the core driver of, of these patterns. Okay, great. I think we'll, I think we'll stop there. Uh, we don't need to use up all the questions in, in the first of the three, um, <laughs> three lectures. So I hope everybody's going to come uh, come to the next two. So I hope we should thank Raj for the for the exciting <laughs> installment today.